So what time is it now? We're about two hours behind and everybody's hungry. This is just the greatest time to present to people, isn't it? Yeah. I love it. Following a finance guy and hungry people. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the eight essentials to a killer go-to-market strategy. I met with, I think, around six startups at the break. And I, I shared this, I'm not afraid to share this feedback that I gave them. I had no idea what their businesses were after spending 10 minutes with them a lot of the time. Because I think a lot of times startups, this is a big challenge to explain what you do. In, if you can't do it in 10 minutes, then we're in big trouble. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, boom. So Shift Hub was a company that I invested in and I was a co-founder in. And uh, when I got there, my job was to drive revenue. We had $500,000 in the bank, and I did all the things that I thought I was supposed to do. I got a fancy CRM, spent money on AdWords, we went to trade shows, we hired some salespeople, uh, we got a fancy SaaS-looking website. And fast forward, one year later, we had zero money in the bank, and we were, had sales of a whopping $2,000 a month. So, Needless to say, that was a bit of a, a challenge. Um, so what went wrong? Uh, that's what I'm going to, I'm going to cover that today and I'll, I'll go over that. I think that, uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way here. There's these eight essentials of a go-to-market strategy, okay? You've got focus and you've got value proposition. That's where I'm going to spend my time today. Uh, I think that a lot of startups get focus they, they try to be too many things to too many people. And that goes into the value proposition of the message is very confusing because they're trying to message too many people. So when you have things like, we all know that the website is your number one sales tool. People make a decision within one to three seconds of landing on your page, whether they're going to bounce, whether they're going to hang out, whether they're going to go to another page. But guess what that goes back to? If you haven't figured out who you're focusing on and you haven't figured out what your value proposition is, and that it's a value proposition that people can actually understand. It doesn't matter how good of a website and how good it looks. You've got to segment your buyers and your customers. You can't message and talk to every segment the same way. You've got to create personas for your buyers. But again, it doesn't matter if you haven't figured out what, a, what your value proposition is. And most importantly, that it's a value proposition that people understand. Advertising, promotion, and events is a, a, a obviously an essential part of a go-to-market strategy. AdWords might be really important to you. Search retargeting might be uh, the hidden gem. You've got to go to events, all of these things. But again, it's not going to surprise you what I'm going to say here. If you haven't figured out where to focus, what industry to focus in on, who the buyer is, and you don't have a good value proposition, you're going to waste a lot of money, like I did at Shift Hub, of trying to be everything to everybody. Growth hacking is a new terminology, and it's really it's about bringing engineering into marketing. Uh, I won't pretend to be an expert on it, but I know that if you can use your product to sell your product, you're going to win. But guess what? If you're not focused on the right industry and you don't have a good value proposition, it's going to be a waste of time and money. Outbound and nurturing, there's still, even though people, there's all kinds of laws coming into effect in all, many countries about email and spam, it's still the number one tool to grow your business. 99% of people aren't going to be ready to buy when you contact them, but when you do find that 1% that's ready to buy and that email lands in their inbox or you're nurturing them through a campaign because they were a warm lead, if you don't have the right value proposition and it's confusing, you're going to lose them. And then finally, channel partners can be that, uh, I'll call it another hidden gem. A channel partner is somebody who can give you thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of customers because they like what you're doing and they want to bring your product to their customers. But if you haven't figured out where to focus, it's not going to matter. You're going to be confusing to a channel partner if you don't even know your own value proposition. So what is focus? Focus is choosing an industry or a vertical. So at Shift Hub, we are trying to build a product for retailers, for call centers, for hospitality and restaurants, for manufacturing. So our product team didn't know 
who their user was. Our marketing team couldn't figure out what message we should create because we had so many different uh, industries and buyer personas. So it's really essential as a startup to get focus nailed. If any of you have read uh, Jeffrey Moore's 1991, 1991 book, Crossing the Chasm, this may look familiar to you. And you've got to get focus right. You've got to have it nailed because in order to cross this chasm, you might be able to go into a bunch of different industries and find some innovators and visionaries. But in order to get the pragmatists and the early majority and the late adapters, it's going to be impossible. You're going to fall into this chasm uh, and you're just going to fail. You're just going to do okay, mediocre in a number of industries. So I, I, I did do a little bit of translating here for you, so I'll let you guys read this. I won't pretend that I can read that, so I'll just let you guys read it. I think this quote is especially true for startups. And for those of you who actually can't read it either, I'll, uh, I'll read it. The great mystery isn't that people do things badly, but they occasionally do a few things really well. The only thing that is universal is incompetence. Strength is always specific. So why I like this as it relates to focus is, um, typically a startup will say, we have a huge market opportunity. There's a hundred million businesses in North America that can use our product. And right away as an investor, when I hear that, I'm like, oh, these guys think that, you know, they're way, they're, they're not laser focused. I'd rather hear somebody say, there's 2,750 companies that we're targeting that we know can use our product. You've got to flex your strength, and this is a good point as it relates to focus. So, how do you find your focus? And I think a good way is to create a scorecard for your business or your industry. So you could have, it simply as have a column of a whole, uh, all the industries that you want to go after and start scoring and rating them. So it could be something like, you know, you might write down one column, uh, pharmaceutical, chemical, hospitality, retail, just have all of these different industries that you want to go after. And remember the other thing that I, I want to point out is saying, SMBs or professional services is not focused. Saying universities in South America that offer an MBA program, that's focused. And then you start scoring them. So does the industry or does the buyer, are they well funded? That could be a really important thing to score against. Does the industry have, um, is there history of change? Are they innovative? That could be very important. Market size, again, it doesn't have to be massive, but you want to make sure it's not, there's only 27 possible companies worldwide that can buy the product. How much pain exists now? I think this is a really important thing to score any industry that you're looking at. Is there a huge amount of pain that they're willing to spend money on? Because people don't want to buy a vitamin, they want to buy a painkiller. And this is really important. What's the competitive landscape? I'm not saying don't go into an industry or a vertical that has zero competition, but why go in somewhere where there's 16 other incumbents that are already doing really well? And if you are going up against your competition, what makes you different? And the final one, I don't have it up. Again, these are just five I pulled, pulled off the top of my head, but a sixth one I might add is if we win in this vertical, What's, is there an adjacent vertical that we can immediately leap into with the strength of the current vertical? So I'm the CEO now at Kira Talent, which is a video screening platform. When I arrived, the company was doing exactly what I said not to do earlier. They were going after academic clients. We had SMB self-serve as a SaaS model. I had salespeople calling on retail, hospitality. They were all over the map. And this is exactly what was happening. We were getting innovators and visionaries in the industries to use the product, but we couldn't win in any market. So what we did was we got focused and we chose academic. 
And specifically, right now we're even more laser fo focused. We're choosing universities and colleges with MBA programs. Now that seems like a pretty narrow focus. How can you build a business off that? There's thousands of business schools worldwide who have fewer seats than they do have applicants. We sell a video screening platform. So they get to see their students and they get to ask potential students tough questions. So we're winning an academic now. So what's the reward that we got for Focus? We're able to actually charge a higher average sales price now. When you focus on one industry, you can start charging more. You become the expert there and people want to work with you. Lower customer acquisition cost. Again, if you're focusing on one industry, your customer acquisition cost is going to go down. There's a lower cost to serve, which I think goes to this next one. There's a faster internal adaption to the customer needs. When we're only dealing with one customer, our product team knows the customer. They're not thinking about 20 different potential buyers when they're building the product. They know it's one person and they can adapt to it. And then there's more predictable service requirements when you're in one vertical and one focus. Because, so, so in our example, we know when a school signs up, they can tell us how many applicants are going to be applying to the school on what date. So it's easy for us to uh, predict service requirements. I like this quote. I didn't translate this one, so hopefully it, everybody understands it. If you chase two rabbits, both will escape. So that's why focus is important. If you start chasing multiple verticals and multiple folk, uh, channels, you're not going to win in any of them. And some of the startups I met with this morning, that's what they were doing. They were saying, our product can do this for this person, and this for this person, and this for this person. And that's not going to work. You're not going to win. So the world needs one thing. And sometimes we try to focus and give them the solution instead of just giving them what they need. So what the world needs is a dead mouse. They don't need the mouse trap. And again, when it comes to value propositions, everyone that I heard this morning was very complicated and sometimes used big words that even I didn't understand. Um, you got to keep it really simple. It's my friend Max Valaket. <laughs> I suggest you follow him on Twitter. Please do that right now. Make me look good. So he sees that I did have some impact on the time that he gave me helping me to prepare here. But his thing is, what's the one thing that your business stands for at the intersection of what it does and what your customer wants it to do? Stop thinking about what your product does, that you think it, like what you think it does. Start paying attention to what your customer wants it to do and what your customer is actually using it to do. So this is vinegar. This is salt. Vinegar there on your left, probably use it on salads, for cooking. Salt you use for cooking. That's what the product's for, right? But in my house, I use more vinegar to clean. I don't actually do the cleaning, but I've seen it being used by people in my house. So, but did, so I, Heinz vinegar, do they pay attention? They do, because they sell it in the cleaning. It's not just in the food section. Now, I know you don't get a lot, you probably don't see this a lot, although it is a lot colder here than I expected. More salt is used in Canada on the roads to melt the ice. Are you giving me a signal or are you just, okay, okay, all right. Sorry. Okay. I'm like two minutes. Uh, so watch, observe, and learn what, how your customers are using the product. Stop telling your customers and the consumers what your product's for and start observing them using it. And you'll see a lot, like, because here's an example, Lock 8. Has anybody seen this product? Okay. This is a bike lock that uh, you control through an app on your phone. 
right? So it's attached to your bike at all times. You can unlock and lock your bike through the app. But what they did was they watched and they observed their customers. They're no longer a bike lock company, they're a bike sharing company. Because now what's happening is people are locking their bikes up places and posting that the bike's available now. It's locked in this location, and if you pay X amount of money, you can use the bike. And then it has to be locked back up in this location by this time, and it's all GPS tracked. So here's a company that started as a bike lock company and became a bike sharing uh, platform. So there's a number of different types. So let's talk about the value proposition now. There's what and how value propositions. So unbounce, build, publish, and A-B test landing pages without IT. Very simple. There wasn't one pitch I heard this morning that they could do it in one sentence like this. You've got to get it down to something like this. So you can either come at it from a what and how value proposition, or Zendesk has a why and who. Relationships between businesses and their customers can be hard. Zendesk makes it easier. Simple, straightforward, gets to the point. No, no, there's no words there that you don't understand. A buffer goes even simpler. It's just a what value proposition. Buffer is the easiest way to publish on social media. Close.io. Close more deals, make more sales. They've kind of combined the, the first two with a what and why value proposition. So at its basic, the value prop is the who part. The customer we service is blank. The situation is, this is the why. The problem we solve is the what. And then finally, we solve this problem by how. I see a lot of you taking pictures. If you go to my blog, which is right here, or at my Twitter, uh, this will be posted tomorrow. So a lack of focus is what kills startups. I see it all the time. They're trying to be too many things to too many people. Their, their market size is one billion, and um, they're just not focused. So I go back to the example of Kira. We're focused on universities and colleges with business degree programs. Very narrow. When we win in that vertical, then we're going to go to the next vertical, then we're going to go to the next vertical. It's also easier to raise money when you can tell an angel investor or a VC, we know this market inside and out, and we're winning. So there are eight steps, but I really highly suggest that you focus on those first two because you'll waste a lot of money on the next steps if you don't get your focus and your value prop done. Focus on one vertical and create a value proposition just for that channel. And don't assume you know your product, don't assume you know what your product is going to do. You've got an idea, but don't get fixed on that. Thank you very much. Any questions? Wow. I, I can repeat it if you want. The concept of you were talking about focus, does that come from also Jesse Moore's book when he talks about the bowl, bowling alley shoes in your pocket? I'm, I'm speaking about the book inside the Right. Um, I, I, so I think fo there's two parts of focus for me. Focus in, in on what your company where can you just, you can just completely own a vertical. And so I see what a lot of people do is they're like, okay, we want to own the SMB space. We're, we're, we're built for small businesses. And there's 580 million small businesses in the US and we're going to own that. Whereas if you can just focus in on SMBs like restaurants with less than five locations and you know, you're just, it's much easier to win that way. But I think the, the second part of focus is how do you get people internally 
to focus. They can't if they don't know who their user is. You know, imagine a marketing team trying to message to 580 million small businesses that are made up of 200 different industries. So I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, it, Jeffrey Moore does talk, talk about it. So if, if you haven't read the book, it's a, a definite must. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.